Well, I want to preach to you on Jesus this morning, but I'm going to do, do it from a very unusual portion of Scripture when I announce the book. Please don't turn me off, all right? You know, isn't it interesting how there's portions of Scripture we just say, oh, I love that. How many of you have a favorite book of the Bible? Would you raise your hand? Favorite book of the Bible? Shout it out. One, two, three. What is it? That's good. That's a good book, whatever you said, if it's in the Bible. It's really good. Mine's Philippians. I love Philippians. And there's certain portions of Scripture we just run to, and we love them. And we return again and again and again. And then there's those scriptures. Let's just all be real and honest today. We're in church, right? There are those scriptures that we just kind of breeze over. We think, oh, yeah, that's in the Bible too. Uh, things like First Chronicles. Did you know there's 1,500 names in the first nine chapters of First Chronicles? And they're not like Bob and Sue. They're like Meher Shalal Hashbaz, you know. And you say, my soul, what names these are. But all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Do you believe here that every word of the word is important? Yes. God wants to speak to us. Well, I'm going to take you to one of those places in the Bible. And before we're done, I hope your heart will thrill like mine is about the goodness of God in the Scripture. Isn't it amazing? You can open your Bible to anywhere and find Jesus there. And so with that in mind, I want you to turn to that exciting book of Leviticus, would you please, in the Old Testament? Leviticus is where most of us get bogged down in our annual Bible reading, isn't it? We do pretty well in Genesis. We're proud of ourselves. And we get through Exodus, and we say, hey, that's exciting. And then somewhere, just a few weeks in, we get to Leviticus. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yes? Confession's good for the soul, isn't it? And somebody says, well, you know, preacher, we don't live in Leviticus. No, we don't live in Leviticus. We're not, we're not under the Levitical laws and all the regulations, but might I submit to you this morning that though we are not under the regulations, we should still be guided by the revelation. See, Leviticus is in there for a reason. God didn't take it out. And there's a reason for that because this book of the Bible reveals to us the amazing holiness of our God. And for the record, our God is still a thrice holy God. Maybe we need a reminder of that. Whatever happened to holiness anyhow? I said to someone just the other day, they were talking about how much they loved the book of Hebrews. That's an amazing book. It's a book of better things. But I said to my friend, you cannot understand Hebrews without the book of Leviticus. Did you know that? You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. You see, it all works together. They don't compete, they complete. In fact, all of the Old Testament is just this unfolding drama of redemption that finally culminates when the veil is taken away and there stands Jesus Christ. It all points us to Jesus. And so I draw your attention to Leviticus chapter number 25, and if you'll take your little Bible ribbon or marker and put it there, I'm coming back to Leviticus 25 in the evening meeting. And you'll be ahead of everybody that didn't come this morning. Aren't you glad? In fact, you may want to read a little bit of this chapter because I'm using it really just as a jumping off place this morning. Look at Leviticus 25, beginning in verse number 8. God says to his chosen people, Israel, and we understand, before I read, look at me, please. We understand we are not Israel. Israel and the church, two totally different things. We understand that, but aren't you glad we have the same God? And the God of Israel says to them in verse 8, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Pause, time out just a second. Uh, the, the seven days of the week culminated in the Sabbath day. Is that right? Now, this is not the Sabbath day. We're here on the Lord's day. We celebrate on the first day of the week, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But they had seven days ended in a Sabbath day. And then... Now, this is very important. They, they had seven years, and at the end of every seven years, they had what they called a, a Sabbath year, a sabbatic year, a year of rest. And then every seven sevens, so every time you take seven years, seven years, seven years, seven years, seven times, let's do a little math class. I know it's Sunday. Please forgive me, kids. Seven times seven is what? Forty-nine. Very good. So once they had fulfilled those 49 years, on the next year, the 50th year, God said, now that's going to be a special year. And indeed it was. If I understand correctly, this church is celebrating its, its jubilee anniversary. Is that right? This is the 50th anniversary of this church. Happy anniversary. I'm curious, are there any charter members here? Would you raise your hand? Anybody been here 50 years? That's wonderful. Praise God for that. That's thrilling. 
I was in a church the other day that was celebrating, I think it's 150th anniversary. And I asked that question, and of course, no hands went up, and that was good. Uh, but we have some charter members here today, and I'm glad. This is the Jubilee. Where does that word come from? Well, keep reading. Look at verse 9. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee. Trumpets were used uh, for joyful occasions and to gather people and to launch out in battle. Trumpets are very important in Israel. He said, calls the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound, and uh, please don't miss this, on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. Shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land, and all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. Fiftieth year, the year of jubilee in Israel, was one of the highest, holiest, happiest times in the whole nation. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because when I come back this evening, I'm going to preach to you and talk to you about the year of Jubilee. And some of you are saying, heaven help us, I'm not coming back tonight. He's going to preach on a whole year tonight. But we'll get through it quickly, I promise you that. But the year of Jubilee was a year of rest and joy and forgiveness and restoration and lots of good things. All of the blessing of God poured out on Israel in the year of Jubilee. But please don't miss this. The year started with a day. And it was not just any day. In fact, it was the day. Would you mark it in your Bible, please, right there in Leviticus chapter number 25? It is the day of atonement. That phrase is first used a couple chapters previous in Leviticus chapter number 23. Somebody says, what is atonement? What does that mean? I'll tell you in just a moment, but if you just take the English word atonement and break it in three parts, at one meant, look at me just a second, men are separated from God, so the Lord Jesus Christ, praise God, stepped right in the middle and made a way so we could be at one with God again. On that cross, he took a holy, righteous God in one hand and sinful, fallen humanity in the other and made a way so that in him we could be one again through Jesus Christ. Christ is the atonement. Every day, every symbol, every ritual, every type, every prophecy, everything in this Old Testament scripture is simply foreshadowing the final, full, forever sacrifice of Jesus that he accomplished at the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, I tell you, I'm glad for the Day of Atonement because it was not just for Israel. In fact, the greatest day in the history of the world was the day Jesus died. Do you understand that all of history swings on the hinge of the cross? that everything God opens to us swings on Calvary. That heaven's gates could never open to you if at the cross Jesus had not paid your sin debt, taken your place, your wrath, your judgment, your hell, and made a way that you could be not separated, but reconciled to God at one in the person of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, I want you to go back a few pages in your Bible to Leviticus 16, and we'll camp here now. Because although the Day of Atonement is referenced this is the beginning point of the year of Jubilee. It is described in this amazing chapter, Luke chapter number 16. And this is really interesting to me, Pastor. When we say we're starting a new year, I understand, I understand there's, there are, are fiscal years that don't always line up with a calendar year, and, and there are certain ways that we measure years like birthdays and anniversaries. But as a general rule, as a general rule, if we say we're starting a new year, we start on what day? The first day of the what? Let's try that one more time. The first day of the what? The first month. Right, we start at the first. But the year of Jubilee did not start on the first day of the first month. That's fascinating to me. It started on the tenth day of the seventh month. How many of you think it's a little odd to start a brand new year on the tenth day of the seventh month? How many of you think that sounds a little odd? But may I tell you why that was the beginning of the year? Oh, I love this. Because... That was the day of atonement. Watch this, please. Every new beginning starts with the atonement. 
every blessing, every good thing, every God thing, every glorious thing always finds its fountain, its foundation, its starting point at the redemption that is found through the blood. So there could be no joy, no freedom, no restoration, no forgiveness, no blessing, none of that, none of it, none of it, none of it, if there had not first been the Day of Atonement. Did you know now, this day was a very specific day, and it was a special day. It was a sacred day, hallowed by the Jews. It happened only once every year, and it was a definite day circled on the Jewish calendar, just like the cross of Calvary was a day circled on the divine calendar. But did you know that in time, this day became so important to the Jews? I love this. Tradition tells us that they started just referencing it this way. It's the day. It was not a day. I like that. The definite article, it was, look, the day. Would you say that with me, please? It was the day. Look, the cross was what? The day. Calvary was what? The day. Christ's sacrifice and atonement was what? The day. Look, if it wasn't for that day, we'd all be lost for eternity. There'd be nothing to celebrate this day or any day if it was not for the day. So what do we learn about the day? Well, look at the end of the chapter. Let's start here for just a moment. Look at verse 29. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Aren't you glad God made a way so dirty people could be clean? <laughs> By the way, you people clean up good for church. You really do. And you look really nice, but I'm not talking about the outward cleansing. No, no, I'm talking about the inward cleansing only God can do. Because it's the dirt that only God sees. Look at verse 31. And it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement, mark it in your Bible, and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments, and you shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. How many of you think God's trying to get our attention here? In fact, if I had time, I did this last night in my hotel room. You can do it on your own time. Don't do it while I'm preaching, but on your own time. I went through this whole chapter, and I marked every time I found the word atonement. If my math is right, it may not be, but if I counted correctly, there are 15 times he uses the word atonement in one chapter. Almost like he's trying to tell us something, isn't it? And would you like to know what the word atonement means? This, this word that was used by the Hebrew people, write this in the margin of your Bible somewhere. Circle the word atonement in your Bible, and in the margin next to it, write this word. It literally means a covering. That's amazing to me. Whoso covereth his sins shall not prosper. That's right. And yet here, God says, I'll provide a covering. Do you understand this is the only cover-up God can bless Watch, please. When you cover your sin, it's deceit. When God covers your sin, it's mercy. When you cover your sin, they're stuck off in a corner somewhere, and you put something over it, and you hope nobody ever finds out. But when God covers your sin, he covers it with the precious blood of his own son, and it is gone forever. It is the atonement. What do we learn about the day of atonement? Let me give you three or four things. I'd like you to write them down. Would you write them down? And when we finish, I'm going to ask everybody in this auditorium, I'm talking about everybody that's listening to me right now, to join me in one of two prayers. You say, well, which one's mine? You'll know when we get there. But I want you to look at this little chapter with me in this amazing day. What do we learn about it? Well, number one, would you write this down? On the day of atonement, first, you've got to deal with the sin. As glorious as this chapter is, as wonderful as salvation is, the chapter ends in a, or begins rather in a very negative way. Go back to verse number one, would you? And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death 
of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. <laughs> you ever wonder why he says the death and they died? He's just making sure you understand they're dead. They're not a little dead. They're really dead. You understand? You know why that is? Because sin always brings what? Always, every time. Do you understand that the great problem in our world right now is a sin problem? It is not political. It is not military. It is not economic. It is not even moral. Look, please, the great issue in our world right now is a sin problem. I'm going to tell you the real problem in churches. It's not organizational. It's not money. It's not that we need better sermons or, or we need this or we need that. The great problem in our churches right now, holding back the blessing of God, it's a sin problem. The problem in families, somebody said that families just don't get along anymore. It's a sin problem. And the problem in every one of our lives, it's a sin problem. The prophet said, your sins and iniquities have separated between you and your God. Look at verse number two. And the Lord said unto Moses, speak in Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times in the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark, that he die not. There it is again. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a, what kind of offering, church? For a sin offering. Why must there be a sin offering? Because, look please, we are all sinners and somebody has to pay for that sin. And it's fascinating to me to see that as surely as there was death to those that rejected the sacrifice and did it their way, even for the good people, even for Aaron, even, even for God's people, look, at this juncture, they were not allowed to come inside that veil. There, there was no access. May I tell you, that's what sin does. Sin keeps you out of the holy presence of God. Look at that veil. Stood there for centuries until Calvary. It was several inches thick. I love this. Read the gospel records. Do you understand all that happened on the day Jesus died? One of the things that happened is the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And I love the fact it wasn't from bottom to top. It was from top to bottom. It's like God looked over the back of heaven and said, the death and the redemption price is paid. We don't need this anymore. And just ripped that veil in half. What? He made a way into the holiest of all through the blood of Jesus. But here in Leviticus, the veil still stands. And yet, May I submit to you, it was not the veil that kept them from God's holy presence. It was their own sin. The veil was a protection. Do you understand they would have all died if they'd entered into the holy presence of God unclean? Do you understand? You don't prance into the throne room of the holy God of heaven in your sin. There is no access except there be some atonement. Look, please. First, you've got to understand the sin that was dealt with that day. There's a second thing you have to understand, and it is this. You have to understand the sacrifice. Now, this day, Leviticus 16, was a slaughter day. Now, they sacrificed animals every day. I wish I had time to walk through the Scripture and show you. If I've got my numbers right, I think there were at least 15 different animals killed on the Day of Atonement. <laughs> 15 of them. That's a lot of blood yet. You know why? Because the innocent always has to die for the guilty. Adam. Eve. You know you're naked, don't you? You think you hide behind that fig tree forever? You think your little apron's going to cover it? Mm -mm. And what does God do? He slaughters the innocent. For the guilty. And for all of these centuries, all of these animals being put to death, what was God saying? Every time they slaughtered an innocent animal, every time it was a reminder of redemption, it was this. You ready for this? You can't save yourself, so somebody else has to die for you. But here's the amazing thing in this passage of Scripture. I love this. Do you know who did it all? The high priest. He did it all. Watch this, please. The people did not sacrifice on that day. They, they weren't allowed to. They, they weren't allowed to touch anything. Look, please. 
The temple and the tabernacle, those were busy places. I mean, there was lots of priests. And on a normal day, Pastor, they were running around everywhere. I mean, they're lighting candles and keeping the incense going and keeping things clean and going through their ceremonial washings and, and slaughtering animals and sprinkling blood. And I mean, it's a busy place. It's a happening place on every other day, but not on the Day of Atonement. Watch this. On the Day of Atonement, no priest was allowed to do anything. They all had to sit down. And the only person who could work on the Day of atonement was the high priest would you like to know why that is watch this because we contribute nothing to the atonement the high priest does it all every bit of it is the work of our great high priest that is passed into the heavens Jesus Christ the son of God now, we've been made priest unto God. We, we bring the sacrifice of praise. Hey, but I want you to know, even your praise contributes absolutely nothing to the redemption of your soul. It grows out of it, but it gives nothing to it. Only the high priest could atone for the sins of the people. And I want you to know at Calvary, Jesus Christ was both high priest and sacrifice. He shed his blood so that you could be at one with God again, so your sinful soul could be covered in the blood of the Lamb. And Jesus made a way into the holiest of all. When Jesus Christ entered into glory and put his blood on the mercy seat, I love this, he not only entered in, but praise God, he left the door open behind him. The high priest made a way that we could come in and so, only the high priest. In fact, you read all of Luke chapter number 16, and there's at least 20 references to Aaron alone, the high priest alone. It's never they, it's always he. Look, please, there is another, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Look, please, the day was a picture of the way. The day, picture of the truth. The life, picture of the life. Look, please please, only Jesus can save the sinner. And his work was bloody work. In fact, look down to verse number 14 with me for just a moment, would you please? The Bible says, he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his fingers seven times. Look, use a little sanctified imagination. He's dipping his fingers in blood, and then he's, he's sprinkling the blood. So it's splattering everywhere on the mercy seat. That's not all. Look at verse 13. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Look at verse 18. He shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he hath made an end, please don't miss this word of reconciling the holy place. The only way for there to be reconciliation is there had to be blood applied. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Look at it, look at it, look at it. There's blood everywhere. There's blood on the altar. There's blood on the tabernacle. There's blood on the mercy seat. There's blood on the priest. In fact, do you know what he's wearing when he goes in? This is fascinating to me. Do you know the whole priest, the high priest rather, had quite a glorious garment God had made for him. I mean, he had the golden miter on his head and had that breastplate with all the names of the tribes and all those jewels. I mean, to, when you saw the high priest in the glorious garment, everybody stood in awe. Do you know on the Day of Atonement, he took all of those clothes off. He did not wear those into the holy place to atone for the sins of the people. You know what he put on? You can read it back in verse 4 and 5. He put on all white linen garments. Everything he had on was just poor, white linen if you will oh I love this thought look please when Jesus Christ made atonement he did not come in all of his glory you know what he did he laid aside the free expression of that glory and took on him the robe of humanity and the robe of humility he came in the clean linen garments of his own sinless life to make sacrifice for our sins Jesus Christ knew we could never get to him so he came to us and he came with his own precious blood. Amen. Somebody say, you believe in sprinkling? <laughs> Depends on what kind of sprinkling you're talking about. 
If you're talking about baptism, I, I believe in immersion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, by immersion, to dip, to mer immerse, to plunge. But if you're talking about the blood of Jesus, oh yes, I believe on the day a sinner comes to Christ, the high priest stands up and takes that precious blood and sprinkles the blood of Jesus and covers his sins. And at that moment, he is made at one with God Almighty. May I ask you a question? What did the high priest say when he went into the holy place? You can read the chapter of yourself today. Study it out. What did he say? Now, there's lots of things he's told to do, but when he actually goes in with the blood, what is he to say? There, there are some Jewish traditions that say, well, he said this or he prayed this or whatever. I don't know what he said on the inside. I know this. God didn't tell him to say anything. Would you like to know why that is? Because one thing spoke inside that holy place. The blood did all the speaking. And I want to say to you that the only thing that speaks for our redemption is the sinless, precious blood of Jesus Christ. Without it, we'd be lost today. We'd be lost forever, but hallelujah to God. There is a sacrifice, and the Lord has made the atonement. And so we see the sin, and we see the sacrifice, but notice thirdly, the substitute. There were lots of different animals slain. I told you that already. But there were two that really stand out as particular and peculiar to the Day of Atonement. And they're found here in verse number 7. Would you look at it? And he, that's the high priest, shall take the two goats, mark that in your Bible, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Why are there two? There is here the slain goat and the scapegoat. The slain goat died, put to death. I don't want to be gross or disgusting, but I want you to know it was a brutal thing when that goat was put to death and the high priest had to stand there and watch that goat die. Somebody says, I don't like the thought of that. Well, that's not about a goat. It's about Calvary. Stand at the cross and watch them slaughter the lovely Son of God and understand the substitutionary death of Jesus. He took your place. What does that mean to us? Dear Lord, what has happened to God's people? That we can come in and out of church every week and sing the hymns and go through the motions of it all and forget the price that Jesus paid for us at Calvary. It's no wonder we're so complacent and comfortable and carnal. We have forgotten what Jesus did for us at the cross. And so blood is shed. But there's a second goat. And why have the second goat? Well, this is the scapegoat. Have you ever heard that word before? We say somebody's a scapegoat. That comes from this portion of Scripture. It has, it has biblical, biblical origins. The high priest was commanded. Matter of fact, if you look down to verse number 21, Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. I've marked in my Bible, iniquities, transgressions, and sins. That's not three words for the same thing. It's descriptive of every kind of sin. You know what the word sin means? Fall short. So look, here's a line. Sin means you didn't meet it. You fell short of it. You fell short of the glory of God. Transgression, here's the line. God's law, God's holy law, you went over it. You trespassed. You transgressed. But watch. Iniquities, would you like to know what the word iniquity is? It means to be crooked. Everybody look at your neighbor just a second. Don't look at me. Everybody look at the person next to you. You know what you're looking at right now? You're looking at a crook right now. That's what you're looking at. Somebody said, that's not a very nice preacher. All right, well, let me make it easier on you. Look back at me. You're looking and listening to a crook right now. He said, I don't like that at all. I'm sorry if you don't like it. The Bible says we have iniquities, which means only God is straight down the line all the time. We are crooked in our ways. You ever see, you ever see them make a man walk a line? And if he walks a line, okay. But if he does this, if he staggers, you know something's off. Look, please. When you put a sinner next to the holy, righteous judgment of God, he staggers and he goes this way and that because he's full of iniquity. We fell short of the line. We crossed the line. We drew a crooked line in every way we do not measure up. This is powerful. 
that high priest would put both of his hands on the head of that goat and he would confess the sins of Israel. I'm going to tell you what we need. We need a good old-fashioned season of confession today. When was the last time you confessed your sins? You know, it's a whole lot easier to confess somebody else's sin, isn't it? He confessed the sins of himself. That's the one thing that's different about that high priest and our high priest. Our high priest has no sin, praise God, greater than Aaron. But he confessed the sins, and watch this. In the eyes of God, all of the sins of the people were imputed, put on the account of the goat. I love that thought. You understand at Calvary, Jesus took all of your sins. And when you get saved, he gives you all of his righteousness. Somebody says, that's not fair. That's why it's called mercy. Christ takes all of your demerit and you take all of his merit. How many of you think that sounds like a pretty good deal? All of your sin on his account and all of his perfection on your account. <laughs> when God the Father looked at the cross, all he saw was my sin and now when the father looks at me, all he sees is his son. Why? Because the high priest has imputed all of my sins into that sacrifice. But that's not really the point. Look where they go. Look at the end of verse 21. And she'll send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities, I love this, unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. They, they tell me that this man would lead the goat. Now, the high priest already prayed over it. This man that was chosen would lead the goat out in the wilderness 12 miles, 12 miles from camp, 12 miles from the children of Israel, 12 miles from the people, 12 miles away from the glory of God. And then he had to loose him and let him go and watch him go off in the distance until he would get smaller and smaller and smaller and the goat became a little speck on the horizon and then suddenly he disappears in the landscape, never to be seen or heard from ever again. May I tell you what Jesus Jesus did for us. Look, he took your sin, he paid your sin debt, and then he made it so you could be so clean that your sins would be carried into the wilderness never to come against you again. My grandpa used to say, cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness, and God put up a no fishing sign. And the devil may try to drag it up, and you may even try to bring it up, and somebody else may try to throw it in your face, but Jesus never does. Would you like to know why? Because it's covered. It is atoned. There's a substitute. One final thing in this amazing chapter. There is not only on the day of atonement the sin. There is not only the sacrifice. There is not only the substitute. But there is essentially and eventually, praise God, the salvation. There's a reason for it. <laughs> There's a reason for it. And what is the reason? The reason was so that these people could be right with God. I fear that there are people sitting in churches all over this land today who are trying desperately to be right with God without ever realizing that you don't become right with God by trying to be right with God. You become right with God by coming just as you are as a sinner to the only one who can make you right. His name is Jesus. Return to the end of this chapter to where we started and look at verse 29. This shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls. Would you mark that in your Bible? Somebody said, that doesn't sound very happy. Well, it is because it's the affliction that leads to forgiveness. He repeats it again in verse 31. Ye shall afflict your souls. Somebody quoted a while ago, the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. This is fascinating to me. On the day that the high priest does his work, on the day that the sacrifice is slain, on the day that the substitution is made, on the day that the salvation is offered, what is the first responsibility of the people? They are to repent. They're to come clean with God so God can make them clean. I tell you what we want. I tell you what some people want. They want a powerless religion. They want an empty form. They want religious motions where they come, excuse me, to the tabernacle and watch some man get up and do some service and feel spiritual about themselves. And I say to you that the work of the high priest and the blood of the sacrifice is meaningless if the people do not respond to God's revelation. 
And they are called, nay, they are commanded to afflict their souls. It's amazing to me how God can make there to be joy and conviction all at the same time. Isn't it amazing you sit in church and you're just overwhelmed with the goodness of God and at the same time you are smitten with your own sinfulness. That, my friends, is God's two-edged sword and that is God's way of working in our lives. And the salvation comes at this moment of repentance. Now, that's not all. Look at the verses again. The Bible says not only do they afflict their souls, look at verse 29, they are to do no work at all. Would you mark that? Verse 31 says, it should be a Sabbath of rest unto you. Oh, don't miss this. The salvation is rooted here and, and received here in their repentance and now in their rest, literally their faith. Repentance and faith always go together. We repent of our sin and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what this do no work was? It wasn't a lazy man's day. Let me tell you what it was. It was them saying, we simply, look, we simply rest everything on the work of a high priest. We lean wholly on the blood of the sacrifice. It was a picture of faith in God. And if that were not enough, I love this. The repentance and the rest leads then to great rejoicing. I wish I had time to walk you through the passage, but look at verse 23. Aaron finishes his work. The high priest finishes his work. Verse 23, and Aaron shall come into the tabernacle, the congregation, and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth. And offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. Do you remember I said a moment ago that when the high priest went in, he took off all the glorious garments. Everybody remember that? He took off all the glorious garments, put on the linen garments. He goes in. He makes sacrifice. By the way, when he comes back out, think about this. If he's wearing white clothes and he's been doing bloody work, what do you think is splattered all over that white linen garment? There's blood everywhere. Can you see him? Lift up your eyes, please. Lift up your eyes and look by faith through the lens of Scripture and see the high priest coming out from the place of sacrifice. He is pure and white and lovely in every way, but he's covered in blood, not for himself and his own sins, but for the sins of those that must be forgiven. Amen. And someone says his work is done. Oh, his redemptive work is done. But when Jesus said it is finished, he was really just beginning and now what does he do? Oh, glorious picture. He takes off the linen clothes and he puts back on the clothes of his glory. He, he puts back on the great high priestly garments given to him by the heavenly father. May I say to you, the repentance and the rest always leads to rejoicing because watch this please. The same high priest that went away for our redemption will surely come again for us. They tell me that when Aaron came out from doing his work on the Day of Atonement. The people were so excited. They were, they were dancing in the streets, and they were singing, and they were chanting, and they were cheering. I've been in the Middle East. I tell you, when those people get happy, they get happy now. And some of us pretty staid people that scream at a ball game and have none of the joy of Jesus about our redemption might could learn something from those people. They worshiped. Watch this, please. I, I just discovered this this week. You know what they did? They walked along with the high priest. Now, get the picture. Here's the high priest, and he's surrounded by throngs of people who are forgiven, who are reconciled, who've been atoned for, who can worship now, who, who have the presence of God now. What do they do? They surround the high priest, and they accompany him all the way back to his house. May I tell you what's getting ready to happen? Our high priest is getting ready to come back for us in his high priestly glorious garments, and on that day, praise God, I'm going home with the high priest. Jesus Christ did not just save you to make this life better. He saved you to take you to his house forever. You know, you can't beat being a Christian. He comes to live in you now. You get to go live with him for all eternity. That sounds pretty good to me. And all of this made possible on one day. Oh, not just any day. The day. And you know the glorious thought that dawned on me last night as I meditated on this? As wonderful as it is that I'll get to go to the high priest's house someday and be at the throne of God forever someday. Watch this. Because of the atonement, I can actually come into the holy place right now. <laughs> at this moment, I can say, Father, 
and he hears me. I wonder, have you had your day? Now, the day's been done once for all, one sacrifice forever. Calvary, done, finished. Nothing to add, nothing to subtract. But have you had your day? I had my day 41 years ago. I wasn't in church. A teacher led me to Jesus. I saw her the other day, Pastor. I was preaching a gospel crusade, and at the end of one of the meetings, I saw a little elderly woman making her way through the crowd and coming down the center aisle in the big arena where we were. And I got to looking, and I thought, I think I know that woman. And it was the woman that led me to Jesus 41 years ago. I had my day. She took a Bible and told me that God loved me and Jesus would save me. And on that day, I bowed my head as a boy, and I simply invited Jesus Christ into my life, and he kept his word. And the hymn writer said, glad day, glad day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Have you had your day? And if you have, how long has it been since you visited it? Why is it we've gotten over the wonder of it all? Well, Vance Habner used to say that revival is just one thing. It's God's people falling in love with Jesus all over again. And I wonder, what does the atonement mean to you?